Well, it looks like, at least on paper, Judge Netburn, which is one of the judges that is presiding over the Ripple versus the SEC case, seems to be getting tired of the SEC's game. And in this video, I'm going to tell you what Judge Netburn just did in ruling yet again in favor of Ripple. I'm going to tell you what new pieces of evidence that Ripple is seeking and why they're now allowed to get it. And not only that, the SEC's objections to this were almost completely ignored. So I'm going to tell you what Judge Nepburn just ruled in this video. Also, Tornado Cash has obviously been making headline news in the cryptocurrency world, and it continues to do so. Coin Center, which is a cryptocurrency advocacy group, is now seeking engagement with the OFAC office, which is the office that puts sanctions on to the Tornado Cash and its associated cryptocurrency wallets. And I'm going to go over what Coin Center is actually saying, in that the OFAC office may have in fact overstepped their legal boundaries. Also, we're going to take a look at Bitcoin and why it's looking extremely bullish right now, not just because it touched $25,000, but because there are two factors in which a huge head fund says needed to happen in order for Bitcoin to have its big bull run in the upcoming year or two. So I'm going to tell you what both of those things were and what it could mean for the Bitcoin price, which of course drives everything else in the rest of the crypto world. And so right now we're going to start with that story, that being the price of Bitcoin and what it could be worth very soon. Anthony Scaramucci, who is the CEO of Skybridge Hedge Fund, who's been extremely bullish on Bitcoin for a while, uh, but he's been recently making some predictions. He's been on CNBC, he's been on several other mainstream news outlets talking about his predictions of Bitcoin and why he thinks that the price is going to appreciate so high. Now, recently, he mentioned two things that needed to happen to put major demand and major buy pressure on Bitcoin and, of course, the rest of the crypto space. So what are those two things? Well, he said, number one, Fidelity. Now, if you're not familiar with Fidelity, they manage thousands upon thousands of uh, employees' retirement funds. Now, recently in April, they announced that they're going to be giving their customers access to manage their 401ks and add Bitcoin exposure and Bitcoin itself to their 401k retirement plans. Now, this is big because this just gives another avenue for people to add exposure to Bitcoin and crypto via into their retirement accounts through something like Fidelity. Now, Fidelity themselves is a huge uh, asset management company, but simply giving access to their customers to add Bitcoin to this is a safe assumption that there's going to be a lot of people essentially dollar cost averaging in Bitcoin into their retirement plans, because that's essentially what a lot of companies do. You have employees adding money to, into their 401ks through their paycheck. You also have companies that are matching that or adding a certain percentage. And of course, when you're doing that and letting the customers essentially dictate what they want into their retirement accounts, you're going to have a fair amount of people that want some Bitcoin exposure. And I absolutely agree with that. Step one, Fidelity, allowing that into their customers for 1k accounts check and the second thing was of course that which was making huge news over the last week and a half blackrock entering the crypto space they have partnered of course with coinbase for things like buying trading and custodying of bitcoin for their institutional clients and of, and of course not only that just days later they announced their private bitcoin trust for their institutional customers meaning they don't have to register with the sec because it's a private trust it's not going to be for retail but institutional buyers, of course, have institutional sized budgets. And when that happens, you're going to see Bitcoin being in demand for those institutional clients. Now, both of those in combination are, are going to drive huge demand. But if you think about this for a minute, the price of Bitcoin and, of course, everything else crypto, why it's going to be huge once FOMO starts kicking, once FOMO actually starts kicking in in the next bull run. Well, think about how easy it was to buy Bitcoin back in 2013, 2014. It wasn't very easy. You had to know how to sign up for exchanges. You had to know which exchanges to, to go to. And most times people just thought it was too confusing to actually do it. Now, how easy was it to buy Bitcoin in 2017? It was a little bit easier. How about 2019 and 2020? Well, sure, you could go to Coinbase. You could go to several other places to actually buy your cryptocurrency. And since this 2020 bull run, how many places are there where you can actually go buy Bitcoin? Well, not only can you buy it on many different different exchanges in many different countries, you're now going to be able to do it into your 401k if you're with if you're with Fidelity. If you're an institutional buyer, you can go and do it through the BlackRock Bitcoin Trust, as well as several other options that they're partnering with Coinbase on. And not only that, you can just go to an ATM, which of course are popping up all over the place. Cryptocurrency ATMs, you can buy and sell your cryptocurrency via ATM. So in the next bull run, when people talk about how much Bitcoin could rise in terms of price action, well, if Anthony Scaramucci and his hedge fund is right, and, the, and Kevin O'Leary is speaking about institutional buying of Bitcoin is right, 
and the fact that when institutional money jumps into something, they want to control 80 to 90 percent of that asset. How much is that remaining 10 percent of that asset going to be worth? So right now, all eyes, of course, are on what's going on with these stories of institutional buyers essentially preparing their customers and their clients for Bitcoin buying. But let me know in the comments section down below what you guys think. And before I talk about the Ripple versus the SEC case, I did want to talk about this tornado cash story that continues to evolve. In this particular story, talking about Coin Center is a cryptocurrency advocacy group here in the United States. And one of its executive directors, Jerry Brito, along with its director of research, Peter Van Valkenburg, said they're going to be gauge engaging the OFAC office, which is the United States office that sanctioned uh, tornado cash and the affected cryptocurrency wallets. Now, with, now, what they're saying is that this OFAC office may have actually overstepped their legal boundaries in doing something like this. In fact, they said by treating by treating autonomous code as a person, OFAC exceeded its statutory authority. So they're going to be talking with OFAC. They're also, they're also going to be briefing members of Congress on this story, which I think is a very important thing to do. But the one thing that jumped out to me in this analysis was that was that the office of OFAC said they're going to be working on behalf and uh, trying to provide some administrative relief for people that have funds tied up in these uh, Ethereum-based wallets that were using Tornado Cash. So if you're not familiar with what happened, as soon as the sanctions were put on these wallets, uh, USDC and USDT, the stable coins that are used uh, for this mixing service, were essentially frozen by the treasury, uh, and it was forced to be frozen, and, and USDC and USDT were forced to freeze the funds in these wallets. So if you had money in these wallets, you can apply for a license to try to get, uh, to try to allow and, and withdraw uh, your stablecoin tokens that you had in these frozen wallets. Now, part of the argument that Coin Center is actually making is that they compared this to something like Blender, which Blender.io is basically another mixing service. Uh, however, when that was sanctioned, they, they said it made sense because Blender.io was essentially a person. It was a person in control of that service. However, Tornado Cash was essentially a piece of code that was developed and dropped on the on the Ethereum network and worked autonomously. In fact, the developer or developers of this really had no control over what the app did, uh, what users used it, what they were using it for, whether to accept or reject it, among other things. And this is the concerning part. It's been made he it's made headlines that one of the developers of Tornado Cash was arrested in Amsterdam. It was uh, he was arrested by Dutch authorities. Now, since doing some investigations, they basically found out that yes, he was a developer for it, and part of the thing he and part of the code that he worked on uh, may may have been used in Tornado Cash, but they don't know to what extent. However, they did say that being that his code was just a small part of it, more than likely there are others that were working on this project as well, meaning there could be more arrests coming. And so this is the big debate right now. Should something like Tornado Cash be sanctioned or in the developers of Tornado Cash be arrested for developing an open source, an open source app that runs on a quote unquote decentralized network? when really they had nothing to do with the illegalities of it. Uh, for instance, a lot of people are now starting to say, well, should car manufacturers be held liable for vehicular homicide? Or should Apple be on the hook for crimes that were committed using Apple's products for things like communications and planning and financing, among other things? It's one of these things that crypto privacy advocates or privacy advocates in general are going to be pushing very hard and very heavy in this upcoming in this upcoming midterm election season. All right, guys, now let's talk about what just went on in the Ripple versus the SEC case because this is more big news and this just shows where the judges could be standing, at least mentally, when, when speaking about the SEC. So Judge Netburn just granted Ripple's motion to serve subpoenas and have videos authenticated from SEC officials making public statements about cryptocurrencies. Now, why are they doing this? Well, they have to do it because the video platforms that these videos are hosted on, to go through the process as it should be, as it, as it legally needs to be, Ripple actually needs to serve subpoenas in order to get these videos authenticated, be able to download them, use them in a court case like this. Of course, the SEC was completely against it and they didn't want this to happen. But nonetheless, they said, listen, if Ripple wants to serve subpoenas and reopen discovery in this case, then that's okay by us. Well, the, well, Judge Nepburn completely ignored that part about discovery and basically just granted Ripple access to what they wanted because of course what they wanted had to do with RFAs, which had to do with a time that was during discovery, not after the close of discovery. Therefore, it had nothing to do with reopening discovery. It was a pathetic and essentially a feeble attempt by the SEC to try to somehow trick Judge Nepburn into thinking that this was reopening discovery. 
I can't imagine what she was thinking when she read it. She clearly completely ignored that part altogether and said, yep, Ripple can serve two subpoenas to the non-parties to have these videos authenticated. In other words, make sure these videos are not faked. Why are these videos important? Well, like I said, it's of SEC officials making statements about cryptocurrencies. Now, depending on what these videos are, and we've probably seen a lot of these on Twitter, on YouTube, uh, that influencers share around, uh, but nonetheless, if they're entered into a court case, it could open a whole nother conversation about what the SEC was actually thinking and the potential corruption of what they were actually making decisions on. So let me know what you guys think in the comments section below because as this develops, it's going to be a fun one to cover. You can always follow me on Twitter. There's a link in the description below. And once again, I wanna thank you for watching this video all the way to the end for smashing that thumbs up button. And as always, I'll see you guys on the next video.